This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. Facebook Design invests in building and teaching designers using the best tools for the job. I asked product designer Keon Lavi what he has learned about design since working at Facebook. I think I've learned that design isn't just about the capital D design. A lot of our work is about communicating with people, collaborating with people, and if you can't get your ideas across and get other people to agree on them, um, and get other people on board with your ideas, then it's useless to have the idea in the first place. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, let's talk about our sponsors, Glitch, Google Design, and MailChimp. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. Whether you're into design or coding or music or art, Glitch is the right tool for you. You can start from scratch or remix any of the available projects and make them your own. And if you get stuck on something, just raise your hand and get help from the Glitch community. Get started on making something awesome today at Glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. Again, that's design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Did you know that the number one email marketing priority is personalization? It makes sense if you think about it. You only want to hear from the people and the businesses that you like. And MailChimp helps make that happen with their robust campaign builder and a host of helpful automations. It's email marketing with a personal touch. Sign up at MailChimp.com today for a free account. MailChimp, send better email. Now for this week's interview. We're talking to Sabella Flagg, a senior interaction designer in Seattle, Washington. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. So my name is Sabella, and I am a senior interaction designer here at Artifact, which is located in Seattle. So I've been doing that out here for about two and a half years now. Nice. I'll tell you a story. And I, (laughs) it's funny, I didn't mention this before we started recording. But now that you've said artifact, it just reminded me that at work, so I work for Fall Creek Software based out of New York. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about in our Slack, something that artifact put out recently, you might know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Was Um, it the tarot cards? It's the tarot cards. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so One thing that Artifact is very interested in is the, we deal with a lot of tech, but a lot of times our clients aren't thinking about the implications of the tech that they're asking us to create. A lot of times we're kind of bringing that to their attention. So something that an internal team worked on that was launched last week were the tarot cards of tech. And so they're kind of like this really light way to engage kind of get like your own team or yourself kind of to get thinking about some of these problems that we may have. So some of the things like, what does it look like if someone uses your product too much? Actually start thinking about the negatives of that. What happens when, you know, a hundred million people start using your product? Who loses their job? What industries are disrupted when your product comes out? So just to get designers thinking more about those type of implications and not just how can we make this more visually appealing or how can we reduce load time? It's like, okay, no, how do we actually launch this without kind of crushing industries and other people? Mm -hmm. What's been the feedback from the card so far? Oh man, the feedback has been great. There's been a lot of excitement around it. People have actually been asking for more of the physical copies. So if you actually, if you go to the mini site, which is artifactgroup.com slash the tarot cards of tech, You can actually download the PDF of this, but there's also a physical deck, 
And so sometimes we've been getting this to, to clients or just different project teams that we have. And there's been a lot of interest with others to actually get those physical cards as well. So I know I know that internal team is kind of doing some work on that. And so there might be some, some future announcements, but you can access it right now in PDF form. Nice. Well, I'll tell you, we are fans of it at Fall Creek. We really like it. I like nice. uh, I like how the, the animations and stuff work with it. I think I was telling... I was telling my boss that they reminded me of the oblique strategies cards mm-hmm. from Brian Eno, which are kind of like these prompts that are so sort of they're sort of meant to stimulate further thought and conversation around any kind of specific topic. But I like how you all have taken them and applied that to tech and really not just tech as a whole, but like it seems like it's specifically more about kind of the ethics of what you're doing. It's it's sort of tech, but it's also kind of like ethical in terms of considering yeah. the implications of your work. Definitely. Yeah. So talk to me about what you do at Artifacts as a senior interaction designer. What does interaction designer do? Because Artifact is a design and innovation consultancy, it means that my day changes based on the type of project that I'm on. And we can have projects that deal with consumer electronics all the way up into building healthcare systems or government work or nonprofit work. Uh, It really runs the gamut. And then you get like just your regular design projects as well that need strategy work done behind them. So kind of depending on what type of project that is, it might change what set of skills I need to use in the day. We have a lot of people who are kind of Swiss army knives. They can do multiple things. They can design, they can de- develop, they can do strategy, they can do systems building. And then we have, you know, subject matter experts that we know who to go to when we need to talk about data or who to go to when we, when we need to talk about augmented reality and things like that. So it sounds like what you do kind of applies to a number of different skills. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of left brain, right brain all the time. <laughs> Sometimes you'll spend days where you're kind of heads down, maybe doing sketches and sharing that out to the team. Other days, like you just spend the whole day just talking. You're just talking about a problem and trying to like tease a solution from it. We have, I think, kind of like the standard innovation setup where everything is a whiteboard Mm because it's super helpful (laughs) to uh, just be able to get up and just draw your idea out on the walls and just lots of focus on on sharing with your team and getting feedback pretty quickly. It's so interesting how the different titles around design can apply to so many different things. I mean, I feel like just a few years ago, if you were kind of this uh, jack of all trades kind of designer, there wasn't Mm -hmm. really a good term for that. Like I know, like it seems like web designer has now kind of morphed into product designer, graphic designer, I think kind of still, stays the same. And I know what I'm thinking just personally for a while, because I did do code and design and did strategy. It felt like there wasn't a good term that could really encompass all of those things. And it's hard, especially like if you're looking for jobs, you're like, yeah, I kind of can do this, but I can also do this. And you want something where you can bring all of your skills, you know, to work. Yeah. It sounds like that's kind of what interaction design is for you. I've definitely felt like it's a title that, applies pretty well to me right now. Definitely in the past, I would maybe introduce myself when interaction design wasn't a well-known term Mm -hmm. as, hey, like I'm a designer who also develops and I'm really interested in the thought behind the design. (laughs) It's like, okay, well, what do you call that job position? And interaction design is, I think, a great way to kind of combine all those things together. Because I very early on realized that I was not going to be happy just making things pretty. Like if someone asked me to do something and I could see it wasn't going to make sense in terms of usability, I, I would be stubborn to the point of like making them redo it or like we'd have long conversations about it. And so as I was kind of traveling from job to job, I was always looking for positions that would allow me to have more of a hands-on interaction with how you're building it from the back end and not necessarily back end dev, just like how does this thing work? What does the user want from it? And then we get into using those design skills that I've built up so that it is visually appealing and beautiful 
Um, but it also works well. I feel like those two things need to be together all the time. When did you first hear about that term? And you, like, when did that sort of just first come into your, your orbit that this was something you could do? I want to say like early, maybe like 2010, maybe. Because there'd be other labels like product designer and, you know, like you said, graphic design, web design. And I started hearing more about this UX design and then interaction design. And so I was, as I was inspecting those, I would find jobs that were looking specifically for UI designers. Mm -hmm. And that didn't fully reach into all the things that I wanted to do. It, it seemed very, it is, it's very narrowly focused on UI. But as I was looking at more, more and more job descriptions talking about interaction design, that seemed to be a little bit of a wider range of capabilities. And that's what I wanted to do. Nice. So you kind of learned about it early then, and then you were able to sort of get out there and find positions in it. I think when we had you featured for 28 Days of the Web, you were doing interaction design. You were at Gravity Tank in Chicago, right? I was. I was, yeah. Thinking back on my resume, just kind of moving through those roles that would get me as close as possible to interaction design, but they didn't exactly exist where I'd be working. So mm -hmm. I'd be doing things like just designing and developing, doing marketing and sales, and then just working to get closer and closer to a position that would kind of allow me to do all those things at once. And when I hit Gravity Tank, I found I was able to do that. And then I continued that when I moved here to work for Artifact. Nice. So what kind of prompted that, that switch for you? Because I know that you had done a lot of time in and around. Are you from Chicago? Mm -hmm. I'm, from I'm from Chicago, Chicago. originally. Yeah. Okay. So what kind of prompted that big switch to go from Chicago out to Seattle? So I had a couple of friends move out to Seattle after college. And so I'd come out to visit them. And I just love the Pacific Northwest. I love how green it is. I love how like, like the air feels fresh. <laughs> you could see mountains and there's, there's water. Like I don't actually think I can ever live somewhere that's landlocked because I – I grew up in Chicago where we had the lake and now I'm here in Seattle where we have all these different waterways. And yeah. I mean, I absolutely love Chicago. My family is there. I visit a lot, but I'd also grown up there, gone to school there. And after high school, I felt the need to not be in Chicago anymore. And so I went not too far. I just went to Iowa for, for university. I went to Drake University there and then kind of bounced around. I traveled for a year after I graduated. I lived abroad teaching English in China. And that was an amazing experience. I wish I could have stayed longer. And I've been trying to plan a trip back there now to bring a couple of friends to show them kind of like what I remembered. But the city that I lived in back then has changed so much, kind of like how Seattle has changed so much now from what my friends from college remember. And when I contacted Artifact, I actually was doing freelance and I originally contacted them asking if they worked with contractors, kind of like through their general inquiries. And Dave, Dave Miller, the recruiter, got back to me and he was like, you should fly out here and we should have an interview. And as I was leaving Chicago, I was like, hmm, this is a lot for a freelance position. <laughs> and uh, I came back home with a, a full time offer and I knew I wanted to move out of Chicago again at some point. Didn't really have a definite plan of when, but when this opportunity came up, it, it seems like the wind was now. And then I packed up and, and headed headed west. Hmm. Nice. You've kind of covered a lot of ground there, so I want to go back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, from Chicago to Iowa to China. I got a lot to, to cover there. Let's start with Chicago. What was it like growing up there for you? It was great. And I have to say that with an asterisk because I'm a 90s kid. <laughs> so as a 90s adult, I look back and I think, oh, wow, <laughs> there was lots of stuff going on that I had no idea about. Can you explain that? Yeah, so I grew up on the south side of Chicago in Auburn Grisham. Okay. Um, it's the south side of Chicago. It's it's the lack of resources there. It's kind of astounding. We're talking about like not when I was growing up, it's it's a little bit better now, but when I was growing up there, like how far we had to travel just to get 
groceries, riding the red line, like from the south side to the north side, like even the tracks. Like, it just felt like you were on the dangerous side of the city, even just traveling, traveling on the train. There's not a lot of kind of community spaces. Like you don't see Starbucks and, and family owned coffee shops. You don't see bookstores. Anything good that happened in the neighborhood was closely related to the church. And so I, you know, I went to Catholic school and then I went to the Marvin Collins prep school. And so kind of whenever I saw com- the community come together, it was always through the church. So that had like a heavy in- influence on me, even to the point where when I was graduating high school, I was like, oh, do I want to be a fashion designer or a graphic designer or a writer or a tornado chaser or a nun? Like, hmm, let me yeah. go through all of my <laughs> options here. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, as you get older, you find, I think when I was when I was younger, because of that environment, it was very easy to equate, you know, if you want to be good or see good things or do good things, you do it through the church. And now as an adult, kind of moving away from that and seeing so many other opportunities in which you can um, be good to other people without having to come at it from from that way. And so that also helped kind of move me away from, from that potential life choice into uh, the design-focused education that I decided to get after high school. Were your parents supportive of you kind of going into design? Oh, yeah. Um, my mom would put my sister and I into the summer programs at the art Institute. Um, She would pack our summers with activities. We would always be in some sort of camp. We would come with her up to the city where she, or up to downtown where she worked for an architectural firm. And she's been there for like, she's the accountant. She's been there maybe 23 years, like insane amount of time. We basically grew up in that office Mm. I think that was really key to my sister and I being able to see outside of our neighborhood and was not a thing that the other kids that I grew up with were able to see or like their parents weren't able to to do that for a variety of reasons. And then around, I want to say maybe eighth grade, we actually moved out to the suburbs and that was a shocking experience (laughs) for a a South Side city girl to experience, but good in the sense that, you know, I I got to see multiple facets of life in Chicago and the Chicagoland area. And that just broadened my horizons so much that I was like, oh, what is outside Chicago? And then I found Iowa. (laughs) Uh, more specifically, I found Drake University and felt really at home with their design, their design school. And that's where I decided to go for college. What was the program like there? The key memory I have from visiting the school after I was kind of making rounds and visiting a couple of other places is that the professor is actually sat down with us individually to talk about what we may be interested in. They weren't kind of just these people that you kind of walk by and passing, you didn't just get like a light glimpse, a glimpse of what life was like on the campus. The school did a really good job of kind of inter- integrating you before you even actually became part of that, that university. The professors there seemed like, and they were, they seemed like they were very um, open and just super smart Uh there was also this period of time where we were moving away from things like quark and just physical paper design into digital design. And Drake University had already made the investment to kind of upgrade their facilities for that. So we're talking like newer machines, the latest software, the professors knew how to use the software, and they could also tell us kind of like how things were and why this change was important. And the only thing that was missing was a web development course and also things like human-centered design and interaction design. Th- those There were no classes for that when I was going to school. Mm-hmm. And there were barely any classes for web development when I was going to school. And the only reason why I still continue to do it is because I, I started building websites when I was 11. So I've been self-taught through that entire time. Oh, and I nice. just... 
I just continued that when I was in school. So I was running my own parallel track while I was doing my coursework. Yeah, I know that a, a lot of designers, I want to say maybe, certainly I think those of us that are are 30 and up, like we got our, that's how we cut our teeth was doing a lot of self-taught stuff. Mm-hmm. So it was good that you were able to kind of have that knowledge. And then what you learned at Drake kind of rounded that out a little bit, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely. think it's really good that they, it, it sounds like the program was really supportive. Yeah, it was. Supportive like throughout our time there and very supportive afterwards. And it was such a great community to, to be a part of. And I really enjoyed my time there. And for a second, I even thought I could move back after I graduated. But as I thought more about it, I realized what I really missed was that time and that set of people in those circumstances. And that I wasn't sure I would necessarily get the same thing if I moved back, you know, a couple of years later afterwards. Mm -hmm which is how I ended up back in in Chicago and then now Seattle. And now between that time, though, you mentioned that you had taught in China. You taught English in China. Did you do that right after Drake? I did. There was a postgraduate program that you could do where Drake would send teachers and students to China and China would send teachers and students to Drake. And there were specifically 26 different cities and, and colleges and universities that you could be a part of. And so um, I actually ended up in the same city as my my best friend, who also now lives in Seattle. She actually was here first, and then I, I moved here. Mm. So like, yeah, it was pretty, it was a pretty fun coincidence. Out of the 26 places, we both ended up in the same city. Nice. Yeah. So your time in China, can you can you talk about kind of what sorts of things you were doing there? I mean, aside from from teaching, were you able to sort of travel throughout the country or anything? <laughs> Yeah, so we were able to take advantage of the same holidays as the other teachers at the university. So there's like a a month for the the Lunar New Year that everyone kind of gets off and you can use that time to travel. Usually people are traveling home during that time. So we just took that time to go everywhere we possibly could. We traveled up to Inner Mongolia, where we spent the night in yurts, and we rode like horses like, wow. through through the plains. And then we go all the way down to Hainan, which is kind of like the Hawaii of Russia. And so that was a very interesting experience because I had found myself in many areas where I was literally the first black person in that space Uh so you're you're like dealing with like looks and like you know people want to touch your hair and um, (laughs) it's like some people it would like they would you know you you could crack under pressure like that but i yeah i i thought it was i enjoyed it i thought it was fun i took it very lighthearted and it actually changed the way that i responded to things when i moved back to america i think a lot of black and brown people can relate to this feeling of possibly being an ambassador for these spaces that you move in. Like, oh, I'm the only black person in this museum. Let me like, you know, be on my super best behavior and be super accommodating to everyone. And when I moved back from China, I was done with that. (laughs) Like, no, I've been in literal places where I was literally the only black person for miles. And here in America, like you can shake a stick and find another person of color. So like, I don't need to to hold that mantle anymore. Mm -hmm. But when we were traveling through China, I kind of got used to the stairs and, you know, the different conversations that we would have on, have about race. And what, what kind of shocked me was when I would see Caucasian people looking at me with the same shock. Mm -hmm. And someone, someone had to remind me like, Hey, you guys aren't in Russia either. So. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) They're not used to seeing you either. So that was a fun moment. Interesting. And then from there, you ended up coming back. Did you go right from China to Chicago? Yeah, I came. Yeah, I came back to Chicago and I came back in the heart of the recession. So that was a super rough time because, of course, you have student loans to worry about and you can't get a job. And yeah, that I think I think everyone who's lived through that time is scarred by it. (laughs) took a while to, to find work. And then the work you find isn't exactly what you want to be doing. Definitely a moment where I was selling things. I, I had moved home 
So I was living in the suburbs and I was working in the city and I was selling things on eBay to cover the cost of my public transit to get into the city. Oh wow! And this internship was like, we don't have the work right now, but in a month, maybe two months, we're going to have the work and we want to hire you. And I'm looking at my belongings and I'm like, the last things I have to sell are my guitars that I've had since eighth grade. <laughs> like I could sell these things or I can take this job in the suburbs that I'm not like, I'm not excited about, but it, it would be a small salary job. I'd be in the suburbs. So I'd cut my commute down and I wouldn't have to worry about this money issue anymore. Mm -hmm. Or do I wait it out and try and get this job in the city, which is where I, I want it to be. And I ended up taking the job in the suburbs out of kind of a necessity. It's like, well, I was kind of running out of things to sell and who knows when you guys will actually have, um, have room for me. So I think for a while I would look back on that as a key moment. And I'd wonder like, Oh, I wonder if I'd be working at like a super fancy agency if I had taken that internship in the city, because then I would have been in the city and I would have made city connections and blah, 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 blah. And then that type of thinking like stopped being helpful because even though I went left instead of right, I still ended up where I wanted to be. I just went a different way. And it took me a while to recognize that. Yeah, I know when I was sort of starting out um, post-college, my mom would always tell me that like sometimes you have to you have to take those jobs that you don't want so you can later have the time and the I guess space to do the things that you do want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, she'd say that those times like help you build character, which can be yeah. hard to see at that point when you're like, I got to sell stuff so I can, you know, get into the city. Like, it's rough. Yeah. Going that route, it put me in a lot of positions where I was maybe the only designer or one of two designers. And it was also very heavy in dev work, which was awesome because development is like a language. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. And it's like, if you're going to dedicate so much time to learn how to do the thing, you need to be able to practice it so that you can keep up to standards. So going that route helped me kind of sharpen those skills. And then it got to a point where I was like, okay, now I need to work for someone who is above me, who can actually art direct me and give me guidance in that way. And so that I can focus on maybe being a little bit more strategic or focus more on uh, the interaction of things. And so then I would pivot in that way. And then that ultimately in Chicago landed me at Gravity Tank and then kind of following that same thread here at Artifact. Okay. So what are you kind of most excited about at the moment? It sounds like you've been now in Seattle for a while. You've gotten settled. What has you excited right now? I, uh, hmm, I think... I've just now started to feel settled in Seattle. Um, Looking forward, I'm excited about the kind of black and brown collectives that kind of are appearing on my feed of people getting together and acknowledging the lack of color in the city, which is not a thing I knew when I moved here. (laughs) Okay. But not a thing I knew that I, I would find super important. But I think with the the election happened and I kind of popped up my head and I was like, where are the other Brown people that I can can commiserate with? And then I couldn't (laughs) find them immediately. So I've been doing a lot of work to kind of pinpoint those, those meetups, those groups, those conferences that kind of focus on that. So I can, can be more with my people and hear more of those voices and make more of those connections. I'm also trying to spend a lot more time on my artwork, which is kind of a thing that ebbs and flows. And that, that includes my writing. Like I love to do creative writing and I also love to do things like paint and print make and sew. And those things kind of have fallen to the wayside because I was so focused on sharpening these other skills that I needed for work. So now I, I really feel like they're in a really good spot and I can kind of devote some more energy to these other parts of me that have kind of been neglected. (laughs) Is there anything in particular that you want to try to do this year? I want to have a show in a gallery. Okay. I have not done that in a couple of years and I feel the itch to do it. I'm also working to get one of my short, I love writing 
flash fiction. I'm working to get one of those published either on a podcast or in uh, a publication. I'm feeling good that I can make one of those happen this year. Mm -hmm. So the short fiction, is it something that would be like a, like a play or someone narrates it, that sort of thing? No, just a uh, flash fiction, which is maybe a thousand words, telling a story in a thousand words or less. Okay. And I'm a huge fan of horror. So a lot of, a lot of what I write is horror based or magical realism. I'm also feeling the itch to write an epic Afrofuturism novel about who knows what, actually. That's where I left off. I was like, I just want to write something space related with the black and brown people. So that's that's a project on the horizon to for me to sort out. Is that kind of a dream project that you want to do, that Afrofuturism piece? It's it's a very recent dream that came up. And I blame the people I try to channel, which are Issa Rae and Ava and Beyonce. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, look at these people doing all of these projects, especially, especially Issa Rae. Like, I was following her, the beginnings of Awkward Black Girl, and it's just been amazing to watch all of the projects that she's been able to work on and to hear about the things she's doing in the future. So I'm looking up to these powerhouses, and I'm trying to sort my house in order so that I can fo- – like, I just need to find a thing to focus on and see it to completion – but it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to do when you, if you have a brain like mine, where you're just like a thousand miles a minute in all directions at once. It always feels like you're neglecting something if you try to focus, and that's not true. Yeah. You need to focus so that you can complete something. No, I know that feeling. I I told myself this year that I was going to do more writing. Like I mm-hmm. before I started as a designer, I was a writer, and uh, yeah, I can't say I've made time for it. I keep telling myself I'm going to do it. Hasn't mm-hmm. happened. Hasn't happened. Yeah. Yet. I'm working on it though. Yeah. <laughs> and there there was a, a Bumble Biz conference a couple of months ago, and the owner of Rachel's Ginger Beer had this really great quote about seasons that I kind of took with me. But what's her name? Uh, Rachel Marshall. Uh, she said, there's a season for being quiet and a season for achieving. And I wrote that down, and it was really it just felt really important for me to focus on that sentiment because I do really get caught up on if I'm doing this thing now, here are the 10 other things that I'm not doing. And that's not productive Mm -hmm. because I I cut that one thing short so I can go do five other things. Mm -hmm. And so if I think of them as seasons, it's like, yeah, the end of last year, that was my season of writing. And that meant all I did was write. I completed a bunch of short stories and I set them up so that when I saw something come across my radar that had an open submission and I thought I had a story that could fit it, I already had it done. It was edited. It was packed up. It was ready to go. And that really helps cut down the time that I'm kind of like, I don't want to come across a submission and be like, oh man, it'd be perfect if I just had this. Like, no, like I spent all of the last part of last year doing that. I have those set. That season will come around and I'll, I'll know when it happens. But right now I'm in this season where I'm focused on um, painting and embroidery and printmaking. And then when that season ends, I'll move on to something else. I like that seasons idea. That's pretty, yeah. that's pretty interesting. I'm thinking about, you know, especially now that we're going into the summer and I was talking with my mom the other day and she was asking me like, well, what are you doing for vacation? I was like, vacation? I don't know. And the reason she asked that is because before I, you know, got this job, I had my own studio and I was working nonstop mm-hmm. around the clock. Cause you know, when you have your own thing, you're, you know, that you're the one that's responsible for bringing in all the money. So I was trying to speak everywhere and take every project and do all this stuff. And like, this is the first time where now that I work for a company, I've got like a paid vacation. And she's like, so what are you doing for vacation? (laughs) And I was stumped. I really had no idea. I still don't have an idea. I'll be honest with you. I had no idea. Like, what am I going to do? Part of me wants to do like a writing retreat. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That'd be so awesome. Yeah. Like go to a city that I've never been to. And I don't know if I'd like get a hotel or Airbnb or whatever, but like go to a city I've never been to and just write. Like don't take any of the other sort of creature comforts that I would normally bring on a trip to distract me. Just like go for the sole purpose of writing and like getting something out there. Cause I feel like 
since I work and live in the same place, since I work from mm-hmm. home, sometimes my creativity can be a little bit stifled when it's not one of those two things. Yeah. And so I need to, maybe I need to be outside of this environment in order to, to stoke that. So I don't yeah. know. Still, I mean, the year's still young. We'll see. Yeah. There's time. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> mentioned Issa and Ava and Beyonce. Who are some of your other influences? Oh, how can I see past those three? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to be really sentimental. Maybe because Mother's Day was yesterday. But I'm going to say my mom, um, <laughs> mostly because the very first website that I ever created, I was 10 years old. Mm-hmm. I did it in Notepad. I posted it on GeoCities. I showed my mom. It was all about anime and these like drawings I had made in paint. And she was not impressed. <laughs> oh, wow. She was not impressed at all. She's like, it took you so long, I thought it would be better. And I recount that story to people sometimes to explain why I can be so intense about some things. Uh-huh. It's like I'm always, I feel like a part of me is always thinking like, would my mother be impressed by this? Dang. And if the answer is no, then you keep going. Mom was not joking. She's like, I'm nope. not impressed. She had high <laughs> expectations for her girls, and I like to think that I am making her happy. I think you are. I think you yeah. are. You mentioned, you know, when you were a kid, she was taking you, like, she always had your summers kind of jam-packed with stuff, so certainly mm-hmm. I think she set the foundation for all of that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely feel the need to to always be learning. Those things that we did were super fun, but, you know, now being an adult... And also, like, I, I have a younger brother now. We're 16 years apart. Okay. And thinking about him and, like, okay, he needs to be engaged at all times so that he doesn't lose this knowledge that he's that he's got through the school year. So what can we do in the summer that will be super engaging for him but also educational? Mm. So n- now I see that she was doing those same sorts of things for my sister and I. And it just it just so happened that all of the art and design things that she was doing just happened to be my jam. I mean, I was able to to take that and turn a career into it. Who would you be if you stayed in Chicago? I had an unconventional job when I was in Chicago for four years. I was a plus size model. Okay. And I'm surprised sometimes when I look back on it, how much I miss certain aspects of it. But I also know that like my particular situation was different than maybe what some other people, other people experienced because I had I had a really good agency that really took care of the the people on their roster, and so when I moved over to Gravity Tank, when you move into consulting, you can't have side gigs that also take up your time. Like anything you want to do needs to happen outside of work, and when you're in a really intense environment, you don't always know <laughs> when after work is going to be. Mm-hmm. And so I, I had to, I had to quit that. But I think I think it'd be sometimes a little bit. I'm like, oh, it'd be fun if I was still doing that a little bit, because that also that was also fulfilling this other side of me that I've had. I've had the same want as I've done with de- development and done with graphic design and art and all these things. All those things are level: the writing, the design, the dev, and what I haven't been able to do much with is the fashion like I've always loved fashion design as well so that was kind of that was kind of fulfilling that part of it so now that that's gone I'm like busting out my sewing machine more (laughs) like oh I want to like this is another thing that that I need to do so it was nice to kind of like already have had that handled in some way so that I could kind of devote energy elsewhere but if I was in Chicago I was definitely on the track to start doing more in in that realm Hmm. um, which would have been interesting I think so, especially now that more brands are, are I think, taking note and advantage of the fact that there are more than just the model size, like skinny model size consumers out there. They're taking more more of a look at plus size customers for men and women, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, it's taken them too long to do so. And it was exciting to be part of the industry when that shift was sort of happening when agencies were adding more plus size models to their books and taking a look at like the gaps that they would have, like, Oh, we say we have plus size models, but we don't only actually have size eights or size tens. Is that actually plus size? No, <laughs> let's do an open call and find those other sizes that, 
you know, people are asking, they're asking to see. And like, you know, Christian Siriano like does the best job of this where he was like, yeah, people were saying, I can't wear your clothes because they only belong on models. So he changed his models to look more like us. And he uses, you know, larger models in his runway shows. And that, that changes the perception that people have. Like they can see themselves in that, which also speaks to like why I'm so much more interested in looking and seeking out those black and brown spaces and voices because it's important for people to to see themselves, especially in tech, to like see themselves in those positions and be able to aspire to them and to actually know that it's possible. What are some of those groups that are out there? I know I know of Here Seattle. I yeah, that's, that's, that's the, the biggest one. Know, one. That's the biggest one. Yeah, that's the biggest one that I'm thinking of. And then there's Spox, which is the Seattle People of Color Salon. And they do a lot with um, like art collectives and poetry and things like that. And that paired with, with Here. I know AIGA has been building out their diversity and inclusion. I'm not quite sure where that has landed in Seattle, but I know when I was leaving Chicago, they were really ramping up those initiatives. So mm-hmm. looking forward to the same thing happening for the Seattle division. Yeah, I know the guy who I think he's still the VP of diversity and inclusion in Chicago, Antonio mm-hmm. Garcia. Oh, yeah. He used to work at Ravi Tank. Oh, look at that. Small world. <laughs> Antonio and I were on a panel back in, Jesus, 2014, 2015, maybe? I think it was for, well, no, I know it was for Weapons of Mass Creation Fest. Um, and we've kept in touch ever since then. Look at that. What a small world. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What is it that, that keeps you motivated and inspired? It sounds like you've got a lot of creative outlets and it sounds like you at least have a good plan for how to express yourself through them. But what is it that kind of keeps you motivated with all this? I want to see myself in the spaces that I couldn't see myself in as a child. It's like I could go and visit those spaces, but I couldn't necessarily feel like I belong there. One example of this is the Kahende Wiley exhibit was at the Seattle Arts Museum last year. And I went and had this just profound, just like awe-inspiring moment. You're looking at these giant, large-scale paintings of Black people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. In this museum, are you kidding? Like, this is the first time I'm seeing that? That's shameful that's shameful. (laughs) Like what year is it? This is the first time I'm seeing this, this beautiful, amazing, these people, this artwork and my focus with all of these. And I think that's why my want for this year is to get published and to be in a gallery is to not be so not protective, but I tend to do things on my own kind of in silence. Mm -hmm. You know, I have, I have all these sketchbooks full of paintings and drawings and designs for things and I I share them with my friends and my family and that's it and that was fine for a very long time that was fulfilling enough for me and I kind of popped up my head and started looking at what I was seeing in public and I wasn't seeing as many people like me doing those things but I know that we are Mm -hmm. so that it's like okay well I'm not the most extroverted person (laughs) So let me pull on this task to try and be a little bit more upfront with the things that I'm doing to actually share more of myself out in public. It makes me super uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it because I think that it's it's important for people like my little brother to be able to look into the tech space or the art space or the fashion world or the writing world and see people who look like him, who come from where he came where, from, where he comes from mm-hmm. and reach these other, these other levels. What would you like to see more of, I guess, from the design community in general? I feel like diversity and inclusion is a really big topic in the design and tech world right now. And it feels like a lot of talking and not a lot of action. Mm. And I was just watching this small video where they were talking about, women who were leaving the tech world because they had kind of reached the glass ceiling and they're looking at upper management and they're not seeing people who look like them or they're, you know, steady getting demoted or having, you know, having people that they train, having men that they train up get promoted before they are. So what happens is they leave and they start their own successful companies, but then that 
that limits the pool of women in those spaces to be promoted. It's like a catch-22. It's like, I can't do it here, so I'll do it myself. But now I'm not there to force you to do it. And so I'd like to see more action when it comes to things like that. And people get scared when people talk about quotas or numbers. And it feels very simple if you think of it like very deliberate actions were taken to make the design and tech world look this way. So we have to take equal deliberate action to change it. Hmm. I like that. I think that's the first time I've heard someone put it in that way. The fact yeah. that, you know, we've designed, well, not we, but the industry has been designed to look like this. So in order for us to become more diverse, we've got to design it. So it looks like that. And I, I think kind of the problem that ends up happening is that, when that design happens, it's always looked at as a negative. Like, I don't know why they expect this to just happen naturally. Clearly, we left you people to your own devices, and this is what happened. <laughs> yeah. So we have to design a better experience. But no, I, I, I really like the way that you have mentioned that. I like that. Yeah, and, and we see this sort of system built up. It's not just in our work environments. It's, you know, it's, it's in our homes. If we think of an analogous situation it's redlining when it comes to cities right like okay yes we've removed the law that says you can't say that black people or jewish people or hispanic people can't live on the north side great we got rid of that law but the banks still aren't giving those people loans so that they can move into those neighborhoods or when those people move into those neighborhoods they are harassed to the point where they are forced out of those neighborhoods. (laughs) It's like the system, like you can't just get rid of one piece. You can't just say like, oh, we need more diversity. And then (laughs) (laughs) like, okay, yay, we all agree. Okay, we're all done. Like, no, like, okay, what's the next step after that? Yeah, like it's going to just happen in a vacuum or something. Yeah, yeah. It's not like we've just randomly showed showed up, right? We didn't just all of a sudden start working at, at Google and, and Apple and all these other places. Like we've, we've been there. We just aren't moving. Look, let me, let me tell you a story. So <laughs> no, and I, and I say that to say, yes, I agree <laughs> with you. But so we're, for people that are listening, we're recording this in May. Last month, there was the AIGA awards gala um, mm-hmm. in New York city. And I was at the gala. I won an award there. I won the Stephen Heller prize for cultural commentary for 2018. It was me and um, a woman, Allison Arief. I hope I'm saying her last name right. But we co-won this award together. And I thought it was interesting about the award. They gave us these little certificates, and it sort of displayed why we got the award or, or what have you. And on my certificate, I have to pull it up, it said, for being a Renaissance talent who works seamlessly across cultural domains, editorial lines, and multiple forms of media for being the definitive leader in bringing black designers to the public, earning you a permanent place in the history of design, design equity, and social justice, which sounds like super lofty, right? Yeah. I made sure that when I gave my speech that I said, you know, yes, I'm I'm glad to be honored for this, but like, this needs to be a coalition. Like I can't, like, I understand that I'm being recognized for this. And many people that I met at the gala were talking to me as if I discovered black designers in like a coal <laughs> mine somewhere and I just, you know, led them out or something. I'm like, no, yeah. we've always been here. We've always been doing things. Even the work that I'm doing is building on the work of other people and other organizations before me. Mm-hmm. So this is not some new discovery. I mean, I can't tell you how many people were like, I had never heard of black designers until I came across the vision <laughs> path. And I'm like, really? And you live in New York City, and you live in Chicago, and you live in Atlanta? It always surprises me when people in Atlanta tell me this, because I'm like, it's Atlanta. Yeah, that's crazy. It's really black here. Like, how how have you never encountered any black designers? in it? I I don't know. Anyway. But no, I, I agree with you there. I mean, certainly, we're not some new novel thing. We've always been here. We've always been making the work. And I think it's great now that we're being recognized and, and celebrated for it, you know, especially across multiple, I mean, multiple, I guess, areas of media, but I think design, certainly we're starting to see that more and more. 
I think it needs to be unacceptable for all of us if our hiring managers or upper management, if they're saying, oh, we couldn't find a developer or an illustrator or an artist of color to do this thing, even though we said we wanted to be more diverse. That should be completely unacceptable to all of us because people are out here building their own like resources, indexing every single one of us that were easily found. Yeah. There's... There's what you're do- you're doing here with Revision Path. There's women who draw. There's people of craft. Like we are literally a Google search away, and we have credentials to back up our work. So we're you can find us. That's yeah. not an excuse anymore. We are literally a Google search away. It's yeah. it's so interesting how that happens. I mean, I'll still get people that you know they've just stumbled across Revision Path, and I mean it, we've been around for a while, so I get that. I understand it. It just always is a bit surprising when I hear it from like grown adults and hiring (laughs) managers and conference organizers that are like, we never knew. Where have you been? Yeah. We've been here. We know we've seen y'all. We're, you know, (laughs) yeah. I don't know. Anyway, where do you see yourself in the next five years? What kind of work do you want to be doing? I definitely see myself still designing. There's so much, of the actual hands-on production and thought of design that I'm super passionate about. And I don't, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Mm-hmm. So when people ask like, Oh, are you going to go, are you like move into leadership? And you it's no, like, cause none of that is design yeah. <laughs> as far, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it gets me further away from the thing that like I've made sacrifices to learn to do and that I'm interested in doing Within the next five years, I definitely see myself kind of getting further in terms of my art and my writing. I'd love to add artists to my title and be able to to back that up with work that I'm not just hoarding over here in a corner by myself, but I'm actually showing the world and publishing, publishing these stories that I'm working on. I think both those things are possible within five years. Well, just to kind of wrap things up here, Sabella, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? You can find my portfolio at sabella.is. And then my artist Instagram is the monarch, which is M-O-N-A-R-Q. And then my personal Instagram, which is just full of like images of my dog and neighborhood cats is McEnroe, which is M-A-C-A-N-D-R-O-W. All right. Sounds good. Well, Sabella Flagg, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to thank you just kind of for sharing your perspective on where you've been and how it's sort of taken you to where you are. I know that when we kind of started, you mentioned that, you know, career paths aren't really these linear things anymore. And I mean, for you, Mm -hmm. you went from Chicago to Iowa to China to back to Chicago to Seattle. I mean, I think it's important for people that are listening to realize that your journey as a designer doesn't have to follow a certain path. Mm -hmm. Um, And that I think as long as you are learning along the path and you're enjoying it, hopefully, that you'll get to your end destination. And I I think certainly with everything that you're doing and certainly with where you want to be in the next five years, that you will definitely make it there. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Sabella Flagg and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Sabella and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, Glitch, Google Design, and MailChimp. Facebook designers work on creative products that are used by over 2 billion people. But what's it like actually working there? Everything Facebook designs is done at scale, so design critiques, metrics, and other factors are a huge part of how they work. Sound interesting? Then learn more about Facebook design and what they do at facebook.com forward slash design. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. From games to art to music to hardware, Glitch is flexible enough to create some really powerful tools. You can even use it for work or to learn how to code. The possibilities are endless. So what will you create today? Get started at Glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, 
Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. Again, that's design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. MailChimp is the world's largest marketing automation platform. They support millions of customers from small e-commerce shops to big online retailers, and they support the creative community as well. MailChimp really gives you the marketing tools to be yourself on a bigger stage. Visit MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music May Andre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you liked this episode, then please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute or two. It helps more people learn about the show, not just here in the U.S., but internationally as well. It helps the show by bumping us up in the rankings for design podcasts. And I'll even read your review right here on the show. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, if you're listening to this and you want to hear next week's episode early, then you should become our patron over at Patreon. Now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives in our field are being told in their own words. So if you support us, if you support our mission, just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge today. For just $5 a month, you can get access to behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time.